Without further ado, we I will pass the mic to Mr. Seal, and he's going to discuss more on this with all of us. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about our children's wired future. Uh, it, since we're a small group, if you feel more comfortable, you can move over. But uh, in any event, is it is this too bright, or is it okay? You think? Can you see? Yeah. If you could dim it. Excuse me. Could we dim the lights a bit? Okay. In progress. All right. So while they do that, just uh, you've probably uh, I won't go into my my profile, my background, since you've probably read it already. If not, I've been in IT basically for over almost two and a half decades, um, and we do basically we're in the tech business. But I think the point, the things that I'm going to share today are really more focused on our think tank, which is called ThinkBlaze, where we work together with City University uh, on research in areas of education and technology. And that's basically some of the stuff that I think would be interesting uh, in terms of findings that we have, uh, and also um, some of the discoveries. Uh, so you know that I'm not completely just making things up. Anyway, um, first, let me talk about uh, sort of when Michelle sent me the note, she said, uh, would I be willing to speak? I said, sure, I'd be happy to. And then um, basically, she sent me a few topics that were suggested, so which she alluded to some of them already. But essentially, they were a lot about family harmony and conflict. You know, things like how to handle arguments between children and parents over eye device use, or handling inappropriate content like porn, um, and so forth. So I want to preface this by saying, first, uh, I am not a child psychologist. So I'm not in a position to uh, really opine on this per se. Um, but I will give you some examples later on, and we can in the Q and A. Hopefully, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, and I'm also not a I'm not a counselor as well, so I cannot solve the problems between you and your children. Although hopefully, I can give you some background as to um, the technology that's involved and what is going through their minds uh, and looking things at through their lens. And that's basically the main the main thrust of my presentation. So let me first start. I'm going to go through some fundamentals before I d uh, sort of delve into the future. Um, and let me just say this as well. First, you know, you're all worried about children online. Well, you're in good company because the children are worried about you being online as well. Uh, this is, of course, a little dated because Facebook is no longer used by teenagers. But about two or three years ago, this was a very hot website. Uh, and it's called, oh crap, my parents joined Facebook. And essentially, they had a lot of trouble with, you know, basically dealing with parents joining Facebook because suddenly their private space was invaded. And you can see all these comments and go visit the website. Some of the archives are really funny. And maybe you'll find them uh, sort of reflective as well. Uh, it's gotten so complicated that people actually have created massive flowcharts and diagrams in terms of exactly what to do if parents actually start friending you. Uh, what do you do? Do you not do it? Do you put them in special lists? And so forth and so forth. Uh, and in fact, many of these features like the special lists and the privacy lists where you can exclude, uh, exclude essentially certain things to be posted, originated from thoughts like this, where essentially young people just didn't want to share certain things with their parents, which of course ultimately led to some of the embarrassing moments where you know, children would unfriend their parents on Facebook. Um, so this is of course uh, a big issue, uh, but just to let you know, you know you're not alone. Uh, but of course nowadays, uh, it's become so pervasive, all parents are on Facebook, so essentially the children have all fled and now they're on Snapchat. Anyway, so let's go back in time a bit just so we have a reflection as to where things are. Because in order to understand the future, it's sometimes important to understand the past a little bit. So let's go back about seven years. Just so we can jog our memory, 2008 was the time of the Beijing Olympics. Harry Potter, last final book, Lehman Brothers disaster, and unfortunately, George W. Bush's presidency. <laughs> anyway. But also in 2008, this was the dominant gaming system from a handheld standpoint, the Nintendo DS. This was the smartphone, if you want to call it, to beat the BlackBerry, which I think almost nobody here is using anymore. And this was the most popular phone in 2008. And Nokia was the number, number one uh, phone manufacturer, period. So that's basically the landscape in 2008. A year ago, a company called Apple launched the iPhone, and of course, has changed history since. But that all just happened eight years ago. And the rate of acceleration and the things that have happened in those last eight years are fundamental to everything here in terms of why our children are do acting with these devices. Because likely, you're arguing over iPad use or iPhone use or some kind of iDevice or Android device that essentially came from that breakthrough technology just eight years ago. But to understand that part, 
we, in our, in our space, in the technology space, we essentially follow a set of laws that we follow almost like religion. And I wanted to introduce them to you very briefly so you understand how we use it to map the future because that might also be able to help you to essentially map sort of the future for your children. And the first one is essentially Moore's Law. So how many people here know Moore's Law? Okay, not bad. Um, but I will <laughs> let me explain it for the, for, for the two-thirds that don't know. Moore's Law essentially is a number of... Um, transistors that can basically be plugged into a semiconductor chip. You don't need to understand the te technology behind it. Essentially, just y the only thing you really need to know is that every 18 months, the speed in which essentially uh, the CPU, or the processing power, or you know, brain power of a computer, will accelerate essentially by twice as much. And the price will also go down. And that's the reason why computers are always getting cheaper and cheaper for the relative computing power that you have. Now, the other way to express it is if transistors were people, if you had an arena that had 2,300 people rough around, around about in the 70s, and you took it basically to where we are today, it would fit the entire population of China. So the whole space concept is changed, because even though it's all virtual, it is essentially power, right? Think of it as brain power. If it was human brain power, so many people are packed in the same number of space. Another way to illustrate is, is as if the top speed of the car would essentially double every two years without actually changing shape, size, or form, but it would go faster or the inside capacity of a bus would double every two years without actually becoming bigger. And you can actually transport more people through that same line, that same sort of uh, highway. Right? That's what's happening in computing. And that's what's happening in terms of the rate of acceleration. So if you have that kind of exponential growth happening every two years, you have a very accelerated pace of progress. So that's one. The other one, which I'll only briefly go over, is Crider's Law. It's essentially the same thing for Moore's Law, except for data, essentially it's storage. So for those of you who've used computers two or three decades ago, you will probably be used to using storage in kilobytes in size. And today, basically, everything is in gigabytes. And essentially, next year, you know that your smartphone is going to have twice the amount of storage. And the year after, it might have twice the amount of storage. And Crider's law, of, uh, Crider's law basically maps that out. Slightly slower than Moore's law, but says largely the same thing, which is essentially there is an accelerating rate. Uh, there's a, a rapid rate in terms of data usage. And your storage will become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And again, there's another law for bandwidth called Nielsen's, Nielsen's law, which is the same thing, but just for rate of speed. So if you consider just 10 years ago the speed of your internet, and you look at the speed that you have in the internet today at home, it's changed dramatically. And the cost of that speed has also reduced dramatically. So these are three trends. There are several other ones, but these are three major trends that are driving basically the entire industry of tech. The illustration here is, for those of you who have used an Apple II in the mid-'80s, and the iPhone 5S, which isn't even the latest model, it's 1,300 times faster, the small device versus that honking box. And the RAM is essentially 260,000 times bigger than the Apple II. And this is essentially in three decades' time. And we should expect another decade for that to accelerate even more on an exponential basis. Now, that leads me to the role of code before I go into examples. Now that you know about those three laws, the three, the role of code is fundamental as to why this accelerated pace is happening. Because right now, all code is written essentially in the form of English. And I don't know how many of you code, but that's not important. Because what it really means here, if you look at the way that code is written, is what if, and forget the Chinese because it's rubbish, it's just an illustration. What if code was actually nationalized, like languages? If essentially China had its own code, or Turkey has its own code, or Russia had its own code. What you'd end up having is essentially closed borders, just like you have in the past, national borders that are closed off between each other. But code is not like that. Code is essentially written in English with a logic structure and essentially transcends all cultural barriers. It's social. So basically, if I write code here, and I may not speak English, I can share it with someone in America who could write it, and I can share it with someone in Russia. And all of them combine this code together and send it back to me and I don't even need to know their language. This brings to areas like open source, which I'll elaborate a little bit later. But open source is essentially a movement where everyone basically shares code with each other around the world. And because code has rigid rules and structure, you can't change. It's essentially the same as, as, ever, as if everyone in the world suddenly spoke one language, but in this case, it's coding. And it combines that. So you're actually using products today that are not developed just by one country. It's wrong to think of Google as a 
sort of American product per se. It, may, it might be slightly American design, but the coders are all over the world, or, or, or other products for that matter. So it's global without boundaries. It's influential. It's what the generation is growing up to. Uh, and it's also very creative. Now, the other thing, which I'll elaborate and discuss a little for, uh, later in terms of how it impacts the future is, it's also democratic. Uh, now, what by democratic, I mean that essentially when you code, it is available for everyone to see. So in an open source platform, um, which is called GitHub. Now, I'm sure, how many people here have heard of GitHub? Okay, three, great. Anyway, I won't go into great detail except that GitHub is probably the most important coding service in the world. In fact, everything you've touched today in code and in basically development of any sort that you use is basically processed through GitHub. It is the most influential service, but it's not owned by any one company. It is essentially open source, where everyone shares their code to develop something around the world. Code on Facebook, code from Google, code from Oracle, all the major companies use it. Now, what is, what's important about GitHub, though, is not the fact that it's a social coding service. The service was established by Linus Torvalds, who is uh, the founder of Linux, which is, of course, the king of open source in terms of as an operating system. And he needed a system where he was able to manage basically all of the different entries he received from different parties all over the world, from Russia, from Finland, whatever, who wanted to improve on Linux. But he had to manage all this code himself. So he created a management system that was essentially open and transparent without any traditional hierarchy. So if you think about it from a corporate standpoint, we're used to a corporate structure where there is essentially almost feudal-like, where you have essentially CEO or leadership or board, and then basically everything runs top down. But GitHub is completely uh, anarchic almost. It's one code can fork into another one, 10 other guys in Finland can work on it. Or another code forks off and some other kind of people can work on it. And essentially it becomes this massive chain of, 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 uh, of, of messy code that anyone can access. But it's also transparent. So a person who is very, very, um, who is a, uh, call it a, um, a leader of a company and is writing code, his code will be exposed to everyone in his company. Whereas previously, it was closed off. So transparency is expected. And what GitHub and social coding and open source is doing to this up and coming generation is it's expecting people to have transparency and openness because that's what they see. They code in an environment that is open. They expect to see things and they expect to be led by example, right? And with GitHub, that's happening. But those same people who are coding in that way, when they go to a corporate environment or to another kind of environment that's more structured, if you want to call it that, they have difficulties with it because the same levels of transparency are, transparency are not available to you, which is one of the reasons why generally people in tech and IT are always sort of liberal, sort of left-leaning. Um, so open source, uh, the illustration with open source here is essentially just what I talked about in, with GitHub, except the major services out there in the world use open source. You may not even know. If you're using an Android phone, everything in there as an operating system is open source. If you're using Wikipedia, that's open source. A lot of Google is open source. Everything from IBM is open source in terms of the services side. Amazon Web Services, open source. So everything is collaborative. And the reason why open source is important is because now I can tap into the know-how of some engineer in India who I don't know who he is, and we can code together. And what it also does is it makes you more powerful because instead of having just one company where I hire 10, 20, 30 people to try to create something, I'm actually able to leverage the benefit of the code that someone invented you know, 3,000 miles away and improve on it and make it mine. And I'll go into that in more detail later, but essentially that is a major thing in terms of why uh, well, progress is happening because of all the people connecting over open source and because code has made it possible. So if you look at code and the open source movement and GitHub, if it wasn't for Moore's law, where processing power made it fast enough for the code to compile, if it wasn't for something like Nielsen's law, uh, for bandwidth, where people can easily share the connectivity with each other, and if it wasn't for Crider's law, where bandwidth and uh, where storage is essentially unlimited and there's no cost to the storage, you wouldn't be able to have this confluence where open source is possible because either the storage is limiting or the bandwidth wasn't available or the CPU speed wasn't fast enough for the processing. So all of these things have come together and created essentially this kind of environment. So what does this mean for children? Hopefully I haven't lost anyone here yet. But uh, what does this mean for children once you take all of these laws into account? First, I should download everything. Now that is something that we can probably see with older kids, but even in fact with many of our younger kids. The concept of storage does not exist for them, if you think about it. We think in terms of storage and finite areas because that's how we grew up. We think of 
how we organize things because we grew up in that environment. But our children don't have this at all because essentially storage is unlimited. I, you know, any music file, what do I do with it? I just download it. I download a movie. I stream it. Right? There's, no, there's no concept of limit. This is the world which is going to be even more limitless. And this is e perfectly illustrated in something like the photo industry. Now, if you think about it, how many photos are shared on Facebook and Instagram and all these places? In fact, it's 1.8 billion a day of photos shared. And you might say, wow, all these photos, who needs it? But people do share it. And that rate is only going to increase, especially when you start getting more people online. And what does that mean, essentially, is that all these photo services that are sharing photos, again, you connect, you look at the bandwidth, you look at the storage, and you look at the speed. It's only possible because all of these services combine and you can create, essentially, environments like this. But that also means that if you think about f limiting aspects of when we took pictures, we were worried about you know, the cost of developing a photo. There is no cost of developing a photo for, for this generation. In fact, there's no cost for anything that's digital. They don't have a concept of that. Yet we are thinking in terms of limiting factors. So for them, it just goes unlimited. Right? So that also means that there's other industries that can come out of this that we can't think of. Because if you look at, for instance, mass amateurization. Mass amateurization is a movement that's happened because of all of these laws coming together and creating mass content where people can become their own artists of sorts, like mashing up photos or mashing up videos. If you look at YouTube, people are able to upload YouTube videos and become artists of their own because they have all the facilities to do so, things that were only possible when you were a movie studio or where they had when you had you know, millions of dollars to create your own production. Again, it's all possible because the cost of technology makes it cheaper, because the bandwidth makes it possible to upload, uh, because storage essentially costs you nothing. And so in the case of Instagram, everyone who shares a photo can now be an amateur photographer, but actually he feels quite professional because the technology will take care of all of it. And he can mash up all the images that are out there. And as a result, he creates more images. For perhaps before, he would make only you know, five photos because it was costly and it wouldn't look so great. Now who cares? People take photos like this, basically, and then basically they, it's more about picking out the photo that they want rather than actually taking that perfect shot. The other thing to think about in terms of what it means for, the, for, for our children is the concept of generations. This is something that we study a lot. Uh, this is a classical generation table, um, which essentially looks at you know, baby boomers, generation X, generation Z, and beyond. And essentially it takes a term where uh, generations t typically are viewed at, at a, in a 30-year 30-year uh, cycle, where either between the birth of the children or is also reflected at a group of individuals who are roughly the same approximate age or have similar ideas, problems, or attitudes. Meaning, essentially, that someone who is going to be 30 years of age should theoretically have similar ideas, problems, and attitudes as someone who is 20 years of age. And this was the traditional viewpoint. But of course, today, when you look at this and you map it against technology, you look at baby boomers, Generation X, Generation Y, where the defining computer of Generation Y was a Commodore 64. And who knows what that is? Great. 64K of RAM. It was a cornerstone of technology. But then you go to Generation Z, and the cornerstone of that technology that started off was Windows 98, which I'm sure all of you actually know what that is. But the two could not be further apart in terms of how they used it, what was possible with those devices and what creative industries came out of these, and the efficiency. So it doesn't make sense, actually, because if you just look, for instance, for the last five years, that's when the iPad came out. That's when, that's when um, WhatsApp became really popular, and that's when Facebook started releasing its graph and making it possible for other people to develop and essentially create sort of this rapid development on Facebook. So these services would, were not meaningful five years ago, and yet we are expected a generation is supposed to be connected with each other over a 30-year gap. When probably for people closer to another area of Generation Z, probably think of MySpace still as a social network. So when you take that, it makes more sense to essentially split up all of these generations. And what technology is basically doing is it's compressing these generations, which, which, uh, which impact basically means that the kind of gap that you see even within your family is going to be smaller. So if you look at essentially a 10-year-old, I have a 10-year-old, I have an 8-year-old, and I have a 5-year-old. My 10-year-old and 5-year-old are essentially, in my view, a generation apart. One of them basically looks at uh, a magazine. If he can't swipe through it, it's, bu it's busted. If it's essentially a computer screen and he can't swipe through it, it's busted. My son is still comfortable with a computer. He wants to use a mouse. That's okay. But for my youngest, it's not. And in fact, his comfortableness in terms of using, using IT is much more uh, fluent. But also in the, work or in the workplace, it's the same. If you expect that someone who is 
you know, again, 30 years of age, to have some commonality in terms of um, culture and, and relationship with someone who's 20 years old, you're probably out of your mind. It's not, it's not possible, right? And it's one of the reasons why a lot of companies have trouble when, they're in their, when managers are in their 40s having to deal with staff that are essentially in their early 30s or late 20s. They always talk about this, this gap because essentially the gap between them is much, much larger. Whereas before in industrial and agricultural societies, that wasn't the problem because everyone had the same issues anyway. So they could relate. Now the relationship, the, uh, the, the ability to relate is apart, far apart because of technology, which is probably perfectly illustrated in this example. Where it's probably more like five generations apart at this point. So now a question for an illustration of generations. How many people here love a clean inbox? Raise your hand. A clean inbox. Zero mail in their inbox. Love one, not have one. But have one is okay too. <laughs> How many have like 5,000 unread mails? Okay, a few. How many have like 100,000 unread mails? Okay, all right. The illustration here is basically for many of us, and I guess not everyone here, but for many of us, we look at the, the, Outlook, the difference between Gmail and Outlook is basically Outlook is a folder generation. It's an older version of essentially messaging, which was basically designed for people like us, where we like to put mail into folders. We like to organize it. How many people here have folders? Okay, fine. So that's all of you. So basically, you have folders because you want to organize it because that's how you search. That's how you find. That's how you organize everything in your household. The Google generation, or essentially the generation of our children, don't have this concept. Gmail has no folders. Essentially, they have tagging, but they have no folders. It's all about search. It's all about basically just querying the, the data set, which means they don't care about the number of emails that they have. They don't care that there's a million unread emails. They'll find it when they need it. Whereas for us, it's annoying. It's like a messy bedroom, or it's like something that we haven't put together yet. We, have, we struggle with that concept because we grew up in an environment of limits we thought that we needed to organize it because otherwise we can't get to it. Right? So that's an old concept. But essentially, that's the, that's the battle. And that's Microsoft versus Google as well. So even Microsoft is a bit of a dinosaur. The other way to look at it, of course, is the messy bedroom and the clean bedroom. And of course, as you say, as you, as you, as you so, so aptly put, uh, it's what you desire. It's not necessarily that you can get zero inbox, but you would like to have zero inbox because you feel that it's a mission accomplished. But this generation doesn't care about zero inbox. It just puts it there. And somehow, they can magically find everything. For us, it's like, whoa, what, where, where, where do I find this sort of you know, piece of paper? But it's OK. They just go in there, and they find it. Because they somehow have the way of searching it. And that's exactly what's happening with this generation and in the future. The other thing is, uh, just another illustration is uh, in Shifter's Generations is from music. Um, before I go into rate acceleration, how many people here use Spotify? Six. All right. So Spotify is a music streaming service. And essentially, there is no limit in, in, in that environment. You just take any song that you want in the world, and you just download it. You don't even have to pay for it. Right? That's Spotify. iTunes is essentially a slightly older generation, where it's a, just a version of CD, but it's just digital download. At one point, iTunes was growing really, really, really fast. And if you noticed, around four years ago, Apple stopped reporting the number of iTunes sales that they had on music. That's because they weren't good. That's because Spotify came around. And everyone, especially the youth, started going streaming music. And you'll be hard pressed finding anyone under the age of 30 who is actually downloading music at all. They're just streaming it. Because again, bandwidth is unlimited, storage is unlimited, and CPU is fast. They don't care. There's no limit. But an illustration of the rate of acceleration is clear. Because the CD, which was essentially dominant from the mid 80s until 2002, was then supplanted by iTunes until around 2010, and on came Spotify, it was only five years ago, and supplanted iTunes. So what took 20 years before, now takes five years to supplant, five years to supplant, and some other service might supplant Spotify in perhaps two years or three years. So that's essentially the rate in which things are changing, just in music as an example. So let's talk a bit about the future and what that could mean. The MacArthur Foundation has put this controversial study out, uh, which basically says that 65% of primary school kids, like here, are going to be in jobs that have not yet been invented. Now, there's some debate about this, of course. I actually think the number is too small, but that's just me. 
if you look at the U.S. corporations, the largest ones, which I just took actually this morning, you will see that three, basically the t in terms of market cap and size and influence of companies, three of the top five companies on this list um, have basically been created in our lifetime. And in fact, in, if you look at companies like Google, they're about 16 years old and the web is barely 22 or 23. And if you look at all the companies that have generated from that particular industry, um, it's, it's a lot more than that. And if you look at the com kind of companies that have gone, sort of had a market cap of over half a billion, five of them, four of them were in the technology field. Now, of course, you know, from a finance standpoint, this is interesting. It's not, it's not sort of the only way to look at it, but it's a good way to look at it. Because, of course, if you look at the big companies, I don't see any accounting firms and I don't see any law firms there either, which have been professions that typically other generations would have looked at as a good path. So just today already, the, the most dominant companies are all coming from areas that are not something that uh, we even knew about when we were children. MIT Technology Review did essentially a list of 50 smartest companies where they think that are gonna, that they think are gonna dis sort of disrupt the future. Most of these are probably names you may not even have heard of, but they're very influential, trust me. Um, whether it's GitHub, oh, of course there's some Chinese ones, Uber, Google, Samsung. But many of these companies, more than half on this list, again, are maybe two or three decades old. So what that means is uh, the future, the only thing that we can define about the future is that it's going to be uncertain. We don't know for sure what our children will be doing. So how do we prepare for that? This is the part which is a bit more sort of, which is um, the paradigm shift in terms of thinking that our kids are going through because of everything. One, knowledge. First is that because of technology, the traditional viewpoint on knowledge has always been authoritative. Knowledge came from top down, whether it's a teacher that delivered it or whether it's the Encyclopedia Britannica or whether it's Webster's, that was knowledge. You picked it up, they were right, always. But today that concept is completely different. Knowledge is to be questioned. It's user generated, it's sourced. People do not expect knowledge to come from a single source. And that's happening even more. So, you know, Wikipedia may not always be the correct kind of knowledge, but it is where a lot of people default to because it's the most current or the most updated. Or Quora, which I don't know how many of you use, but Quora is extremely popular as a service where people basically answer every single question in their domain expertise. And it's where a lot of sort of intellectuals spend their time answering questions to the crowd. So knowledge is now something that's a commodity and is also something that everyone creates. Everyone can make it, whether you're a child or whether you're an adult, whether they have expertise, whether they have no expertise, you create some form of knowledge and share it with the world. The other one about this is intelligence, the viewpoint and intelligence. Our generation and prior generations looked at this intelligence as an individual thing, as a singular effort. I was really smart, I'm really smart. It's all about being a really intelligent person. But again, this generation is looking at intelligence as a network thing. It is not about individual intelligence, it is about network intelligence. The strength of your intelligence is not based on one person who is super smart. It is based on the strength of your social network, the strength of your intelligence network or network intelligence. And this is um, basically what people call the network effect. Where through, you know, and I'll go and talk about this a little bit later, but essentially through creating connections with people, through serendipitous connections and collaboration and, and and creativity, whether it's through coding, whether it's through the open source networks, people can basically come together and create creative and amazing ideas that they couldn't do before. Uh, one illustration of that is the API economy. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with APIs. Right, the IT guy. All right, so an API stands for Application Programming Interface. An Application Programming Interface is essentially a plugin where you can access the data and the knowledge, if you will, and intelligence of any of these companies for your own use. So the perfect illustration, of course, is Facebook, uh, Facebook. If you remember, when you all joined Facebook, you all got these annoying marketing messages and people playing games and saying, please join Farmville, please join Farmville. That's because they had access to your social graph, which is an API that Facebook gives out. So you can access that graph and you can access the users on Facebook for a fee or for a service. In this case, it made Facebook more popular because they used that graph. They were able to access it. But the point is that in order for this company, Zynga, to reach out to millions of customers 
and understand who to, how to target them. They couldn't do that before. Now with Facebook, they just access the API and they can reach out to all of them. Uh, and the same is true for Amazon in terms of cloud computing, or the same is true for Google or for Apple. Every one of you who's using an app on Apple is essentially using an API that Apple allows people to use as a platform so they can distribute their product there and use the intelligence that Apple offers. So when Apple launches HealthKit, it gives information for health application developers so that you can basically measure heartbeat or that you're maybe able to measure you know, sort of um, speed or rate or you know, that kind of stuff, information that could be useful. Now, what that means for our children's generation, they're growing up in an environment where this is no longer proprietary information. Proprietary information was something that we used to trade on. It was something that was special to us. That's why we have copyright and trademark and so on. But now proprietary information for this no longer exists. I just use what Apple has as a platform. I use their data according to their rule set and I can accelerate. Knowledge essentially is easily accessible to me. There is no price in, in the traditional sense. Um, the trust economy works exactly the same way. So as a result, because of the whole network intelligence, there's also this aspect of network trust. Many of us in this room, let me see, how many people here actually have rented anything on Airbnb? Two, all right. And the reason a lot of people don't rent stuff on Airbnb or are not willing to, or let me ask the question differently. How many people here actually have considered renting out their home on Airbnb? Yeah, right, okay, zero. So. It's a perfect illustration of a generations once more. Because we are of a generation where we don't, we don't have the trust because we didn't grow up in a networked environment. We don't trust the network. We don't trust network intelligence. But the generation that puts out stuff on Airbnb, which happens to be a million homes, which is larger than the Marriott hotels as a hotel chain, they all do that and they are happy to do so. Or every one of the people who buy on Amazon or who buy on eBay who have never seen that person, who have no idea. The only thing they trust is the fact that a thousand people there said, I like this guy. He's got a five-star rating. That's it. They don't know who he is. That concept for us is alien, that we would basically buy something from a person that we've never met just because 5,000 other people who we have also never met said, that's okay. All right? So that's alien. But for all of these businesses, whether it's Uber, which is like a $40 billion company now, or Lending Club, which is basically a lending service that allows people to lend money, again, on the basis that 5,000 other people said he's, he's good for the money. But you have no idea wh whether that's true. All of these services are possible because that network intelligence exists. And it works, which is why people can take Uber rides, or which is why you can rent something out on Airbnb, or why people are even willing to open their homes and rent out an Airbnb home. That's, that's the world that they're growing up in. And they essentially trust that, something that we don't really understand. So this accelerating pace of change is just going to continue. And what we should expect, essentially, for the next, uh, uh, up until 2051, so this is a deeper topic which I won't go into, but the expectation is, is that by around 2050, we will be reaching what's called the singularity, where essentially computers and their CPU power will be so smart that they're basically going to have a form of consciousness and will be able to do things better and faster than us in almost every way which if you think about simple calculations, they can do anyway. So that's kind of what's happening with the pace of change. Now, the other thing that I wanted to talk, cover on is innovation, because that to me is the key part where our children will be playing a role in the future. If you look at the history, and this basically is OECD data, there is a correlation between the number of people in the world and the rate of innovation. And in fact, in the last, really the rate of innovation and the GDP rate uh, has accelerated tremendously every year. And in fact, it's very similar to the rate of technology. So the more technology is, the more connectedness there is, the more innovation there is, and therefore there is more sort of, um, uh, there's more income and there's more prosperity as a whole. So most people will argue, will argue generally that things are better now than they were 50 years ago, for instance. And this is basically possible, oh, sorry. And this is basically possible because of the network environment. Because people, when talk about diversity or collaboration or idea sharing, uh, all of what I talked about before is what technology is really enabling. Technology is enabling people to connect with each other, to basically have, like with code, because bandwidth is makes it easily available to, for me to connect, I can share my ideas with someone, you know, 100 miles away, 5,000 miles away, share a cool idea with 20 other people and create something cool. Something that you could only do when you had to physically travel to a location and sort of huddle together in a room and figure out. Now with the internet, it basically is on a global scale and innovation will continue to scale up. And so what that means is the future continues to reinvent itself. So ideas that we think are true today are no longer true tomorrow. In fact, 
when we thought that MySpace was a dominant social network, we were probably all wrong. But at that time, that seemed like a good idea. Or for that matter, who thought that Nokia was going to be dead as a mobile phone company? Nobody expected it. And all industries are being disrupted because the rate of technology is accelerating so quickly. Just like an example that I gave on the CD. You could build a business on the fact that the CD would work for another 20 years. But now, even Spotify might be disrupted in the next two or three years. And so technology today that seem like far out, whether it's wearables uh, or even voice technology uh, with Siri. Everyone laughed about Siri because essentially it's, it was talking nonsense. But the thing is, is that in about a year or two, Siri will be very serious. Uh, and that's not an intended pun. It's just that they will have all the processing power and the knowledge that it has from all the questions people have asked and input it into the big data environment that is Siri to basically create a form of network intelligence of its own. Because everyone is inputting indirectly into Siri, asking questions. After every time they ask a question, Siri becomes more intelligent. Another form of network intelligence. And so in one or two years, Siri will become a very useful tool. So um, Peter Drucker, who was a famous, uh, I think, baby boomer, actually, uh, a management consultant, essentially had a quote here, which is, the best way to predict the future is to create it. That, to me, is um, where the future is likely to be for many of our children. When I talked about how 65% of well, MacArthur Foundation said that 65% of the world, uh, of, 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 uh, our, um, of the jobs of our children are not, going, are not invented yet, it's very much in this vein. If you look at recently, there's a lot of activity in startups. It's still a small environment. It's still a small number in comparison to where it could be. But everyone is now thinking about starting up a startup. The idea of doing something by yourself is now possible because you have network intelligence. I can now start a business by using a Facebook API or Apple APIs to basically accelerate my business. I do not need to work for someone larger, for instance, to be able to do that. I can start my own startup for very little money and create a company that could be interesting, which is why you have so much activity in the startup space. But that's still only a small number. But in about 10, 20, or 30 years, are we all going to be working for a large corporation? Or is it more likely that we'll be all be launching our small little companies that essentially take advantage of network intelligence and, network, uh, and connected knowledge around the world to create new companies and create new sort of interesting products? And that's essentially what Peter Drucker is talking about, where the future, you just make it because the platforms are available to you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about multitasking uh, and other areas just because um, I was asked to talk about controversial topics. So I'll cover that a little bit, and then we can go to Q&A. The first thing is, is I get this question a lot because everyone's concerned about sort of how much digital time people should have in terms of multitasking and whether it makes them distracted. And I think, I forgot who, but you know, they call it sort of, you know, Facebook was, I think, the weapons of mass distraction and that kind of stuff. Um, so let me just clarify a few points. First of all, there's no such thing as multitasking. Okay, so multitasking is not something that we are biologically wired to do. Um, the, the term for it really is task switching, which basically means that you're switching from one uh, task to another. And uh, the idea here basically is that is the young generation today more capable in switching from one task to another faster because they've had access to technology earlier and essentially a working environment that is more distracted. And the resumption lag is basically how quickly you're able to recover from that task switch. Um, so if you look at, for instance, someone listening to music uh, and doing work at the same time, uh, in fact, if they're listening to the music, they have to recover to concentrate on another piece of work. And for us, who have not grown up in this environment, we find this kind of switching harder because we've been used to working in a more sort of, um, let's say, concentrated manner, if you will. Uh, but the argument goes that younger generations are able to task switch much more efficiently. But there is more thinking about that now because task switching, whereas our generation likes to talk about task switching as something that is bad because essentially it distracts you, the technologists around us, and I'll, I'll give some examples here, uh, argue that task switching is in fact more natural. And it's fact, in fact that we're wired to do. Because how many people here actually are able to solitarily work on one single project for two hours concentrated in your own office today? What happens when you sit down for two hours and you're concentrating on this, I don't know, topic of work that you're doing? It's typically very hard, even for adults to do. So why are we expecting our children to have the same kind of concentration, for instance? And an example here, for instance, is basically um, uh, uh, browsing. How many people here browse with tabs? Okay, so less than half, but still a good number. Tabs was invented in large part because they observed the behavior uh, in browsers where people started to basically just create, you know, first they thought of it just as notes, but they noticed that people are actually um, switching from one tab to another. 
So if you're actually someone who's thinking in the traditional sense, you should finish one tab and go into the next tab and close it. But no, in fact, tabs are 100. In many cases, you end up having 50 to 100 tabs. It goes unlimited because it's a train of thought and saying, wait a second, I want to I wanna remember this, but I want to come back to it. So essentially, they do the equivalent of a post-it note, but they come back to it all the time. So tabs ended up not being something that you uh, it being ended, uh, being ended up being used in a way where people used it to remind themselves and to essentially task switch from one to give them some kind of level of distraction and actually create more efficiency. In some cases, some studies at the Naval Research suggested that if you task switch, it is a way to be more productive because you can relax from that activity. For instance, let's say you're working on something difficult and you go up and go for a walk. Right there is a task switch. You just stopped something and you came back to it. That's not a bad thing per se. Now, going into environments like this is Google's office, but if you go to the Valley and you go to many other places like this in the technology space, all of the office is essentially designed in that way, uh, which is basically around the food, really. Uh, and why is food free? Because people congregate around the food. And the reason they have designed it this way is because they, they believe, and I guess they have a lot of psychologists and researchers that would prove the theory, theory as well, that by creating breaks for people to go for their snacks, they also connect with other people to get brighter ideas which is how basically creativity is created. It's creating essentially more forms of serendipitous connections. So imagine you're working on something difficult, you need a break, which is typically 30 minutes, 15 minutes or something like that, and then you basically go and get a snack because you need to fuel your brain. So you go and get a snack, and there's three other guys who are also snacking on something. What happens is that they chat. Maybe they chat and share about the problem. Maybe they talk about something different. Maybe they talk about their girl problems. Who knows? But during that conversation, there's an expectation that a spark happens and something interesting happens in that environment where a new idea will be formed. That's what they're hoping for. But what it also does is, if you look at Google, nobody will say that Google or Facebook or Yahoo are unproductive companies. Nobody is saying that. Everyone's saying that these are incredibly productive environments with an office where most people are snacking. Right? But they work hard. But essentially, they work hard for that 15 or 30 minutes, then they have a snack for 10 minutes, and then they go back again. And if you think about how you like to work, is that how you would like to work? And do you think you're more productive this way? Or do you work uh, better by just singularly focusing on the task for two or three hours at a go? And that's basically what many of the technology companies are now doing because they want to foster this type of environment and essentially promoting, in fact, task switching and, and uh, changing of environments to promote creativity and diversity. So the network effect here, again, is uh, very important because I think for our children in the future, creativity and being able to create your own future is important because you don't know what job you're going to be at or what you're going to be working for. Uh, you have to be flexible. So you need to have an environment where and all the companies in, in the Valley focus on this to create more network connections. Serendipity is all about social connections between people who connect with each other. So somebody who may be doing something completely different has an idea that I can use. Um, Diversity, obviously, that's just because of uh, variance. Collaboration, collaboration isn't just individual. Collaboration also comes from collaborating with companies because they have APIs or access. Uh, and of course, the freedom. Now, freedom, again, the ability to do what they want to do. And it's expected because as they work with, uh, as I mentioned about GitHub, that environment is all about freedom and transparency. They expect to be working in an environment like that. If you put them in an environment where they're restricted, they feel locked up. And of course, hopefully, that will bring some creativity into the picture. So I'll close up with um, another area of um, discussion that comes up. This organization is called Mama, Moms Against Minecraft Addiction. So how many kids here play Minecraft? Or you, you play? Sure, for a lot of them. So <laughs> Minecraft is one of those things that, um, Minecraft is uh, a slightly controversial topic because sometimes fights erupt over it in their homes. So I want to cover that a little bit because, you know, the viewpoint is that that's what we see from a generational standpoint. We see people on a computer, zombie-like faces, um, you know, not getting any sunlight maybe, and uh, sort of wasting their life away on the computer. But what they see is uh, a colorful world. That's the environment. They're playing with their friends, and that's not what we see. We see something very different because we want them to do something outside maybe, or we want them to play tennis, or we want them to, I don't know, get good grades or something. But when you go and look at the viewpoints, these are worlds that they create. They invent them. All the things that the tech generation is trying to promote, things that Google is trying to promote, is what's happening in an environment like Minecraft. They have collaboration. They have freedom. They have creativity. And that's basically what 
uh, it w it's what actually what they want, in effect. And it gives them the break as well. Now, the example I want to give here is for us as a slightly older generation, imagine we're watching Game of Thrones, which I think all of you have watched probably, and we're really into it. And here's Ned Stark, his head just about to be cut off. And we don't know what's going on. And suddenly your mom calling you and says to turn off the TV. And you're like, oh, shit. You know, I, uh, I, 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 mom, I need five more minutes, okay? Does that sound familiar? Five more minutes. You wait five more minutes. It's like, no, no, still has to do it because Ned, Ned Stark's head is still on. They haven't chopped it off yet. <laughs> and then, you know, it's dinner time or it's homework time or it's whatever. And they nag and nag and nag. And guess what happens? The TV gets turned off. Now, how do you feel if that happened to you? <laughs> now, it happened once. Imagine if this happens every day. Certain feelings will start coming out. You will get upset because every time you're at a cliffhanger, you're just getting pissed, right? And so, why do you have these struggles with your children? Part of it is because, what we've seen anyway, is because that happens a lot. And it's not necessarily just cutting them off a cliffhanger, because games are designed to be cliffhangers all the time. That's the other thing. Unlike a TV episode, where things close off at a certain time, uh, games are freeform. So you always create your own cliffhanger. It's creative in that sense. So there are different ways of managing it, except parents don't understand that because they're not playing with them. They don't, it's not part of their world. So they just see it as the device and they force and turn it off. So they, the children become angry and then they don't know what's going on. And that's one of the struggles. And so one of the things that we sort of implement is we have to sort of uh, finish off a level rule at home, which is essentially, okay, fine, finish off your level or finish off whatever it is that you do as a task and then you go. So then at least they know they have a finite endpoint as opposed to time. Because the concept of time for this generation is very different. Again, we grew up in an environment where time is finite. This, is, this, this, uh, this generation doesn't have the same relationship to time as we do, for all the reasons as mentioned before. So this is something that I want to close off and then we can open the Q&A for all sorts of things. Is um, something I took at ISF, where my son was. And this is a, um, uh, a QR code. And I took this one two years ago. And I haven't got any recent ones, but it still illustrates the point. The, most of the, I think the teacher put up something about to access a video over a QR code. Most of the parents had no idea what a QR code was at that point. And all the children helped them figure it out. But it's interesting because it's a simple example of where, and a very simple thing, but here we have the children essentially telling parents what to do. And it's not even about what to do, it's about helping. And it's about recognizing that this younger generation actually knows a whole lot more about certain things than, than we give them credit. And I think with technology, that's even more so because we find that there's so much separation between the two. We have no understanding what they're doing and then we judge them based on it, uh, judge, uh, judge them based on that. But in fact, there's a lot of um, uh, creativity and freedom that they need in order for them to thrive. And technology offers that because all of that is available to them. And they actually are comfortable on the iPad and they're comfortable in accessing and comfortable in search in ways that we are very uncomfortable with. So with that, I'll just close with a quote and then to a Q&A. Uh, there's a famous Toffler quote, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn and relearn. Basically everything you learned today is probably wrong tomorrow. Companies that were big today are probably dead tomorrow. So the future is uh, uncertain. We have to prepare our children for that future. Thank you.